I'll start out by declaring where I was born, and I also grew up on a farm, since there's four <laughs> or five of us who apparently have grown up on farms. Never milked a cow in my life. However, my parents decided as a hobby they would grow 10,000 apple trees, so I've picked 2.5 million apples in my life, <laughs> which is why I ended up at Harvard studying nutrition. So um, today, uh, Sarah has asked me to, to find common ground for, uh, on fish. Um, some of you saw me here and said, oh, Eric, great, you're gonna talk about alcohol. Um, I think Antonio and Miguel covered that very nicely, showing how important alcohol was as part of the Mediterranean diet. So um, the other thing that Sarah said to me is, um, this is a very smart audience, but don't to show too many charts and graphs. It should be like a TED Talk. So here's my um, hope of trying to get to a TED Talk. <laughs> this is how TEDs uh, like to talk about fish. So I'll, sorry, I'll get right onto the data. Um, I, I couldn't find one of Ted Kennedy fishing. He only sails. So um, th this is some recent data that a student in our department, Dan Wong, put together um, with, uh, with uh, Walt, looking at sort of where we have come in the last 15 years in terms of what we eat. And uh, in our alternative healthy eating index, a higher score is better. So um, if you eat no trans fat, you will get a 10. And if you drink no sugar sweetened beverages, you will get a 10. And if you have a lot, you will get zero. Uh, conversely, if you eat a lot of fish, you'll get a 10, and if you don't, you'll get a zero. And you can see over the last 12 years, looking at N. Haynes, uh, we've done a really good job with trans fat. Um, I, I don't know if I can point to it, but that's okay. Um, we've gone up, and in fact, we've almost got rid of all the trans fat in the food supply. But if you look at the bottom, the yellow one that you can't quite see is long-chain fatty acids, um, omega-3 fatty acids. That would be from... Uh, seafood sources. So it's the area where all of us who have sat on dietary guidelines committees and IOM committees have screamed that everybody should have more fish, two servings a week. We have, obviously the message hasn't gotten through. So um, the, the guidelines uh, committee that I sat on and the, the last one that is currently standing actually specifically says uh, in, in the U.S. guidelines is to increase the amount and variety of seafood consumed by choosing seafood in place of some meat and poultry. So this was like a big step because they finally uh, shouted down the um, lobbyists from the meat industry saying, you know, it's okay if some of the meat gets replaced with seafood. I'm really looking forward to the 2015 because I've seen the, the verbiage that's in the scientific advisory point and it also is pointing towards this if not a stronger message and even actually coming out and saying for commonly consumed fish species in the United States such as bass, cod, trout, and salmon, Farm-raised seafood has as much or more of the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, and DHA, as the same species captured wild. So that will speak to some of the sustainability issues, although we still don't have a good way of, of farming enough fish to supply the entire population with two servings a week. So uh, there's a lot to work on there. Um, this is where we started uh, with uh, old ways, where fish was in the middle. Um, it was an important part of the Mediterranean diet pyramid. And some of this actually dates back to the 70s, where they studied the Inuits. Uh, it was mentioned earlier. They had a, hum a, a humongous amount of omega-3 fatty acids in their diet from eating fish and whale and, and other things. But they also lived very differently from us, so it's actually probably no wonder they had lower risk of cardiovascular disease, or it was almost non-existent. They had a little bit higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke uh, because the omega-3s lead to uh, um, a quicker bleeding time. So um, the, the next point in the story sort of looks at uh, some work that our colleague David Siskovic did in the Pacific Northwest, looking at N3 fatty acids intake and sudden death. And this was the first time where someone said, wow, it looks to be specific to reducing risk of arrhythmias that would uh, lead to sudden cardiac death. In fact, found a very strong inverse association. And you look down at that bottom level, and his estimate was that it was 470 milligrams per day, which is quite a bit more than the current dietary guidelines are. At, they're at about 250 milligrams per day. But still, it does look like that omega-3 fatty acids are important in cardiomyocytes, to, uh, important for, for signaling in the heart, and also important for clotting. So it does point to reasons why we think that omega-3 fatty acids should be beneficial, and in this case, pointing specifically at long chain, those from uh, fish sources, seafood sources. So this is something, um, before Dari escaped from Harvard, this is something we put together um, uh, looking at sort of, this was all the, the studies that have been published at the time. Uh, in 2006, and these are, each point represents um, one of the points from a category from a study, so whether it's a trial or an observational study, and this does sort of tell a nice story, and um, I'll give credit to Dari for sort of drawing the line between here, because it does look like at about 250 milligrams per day, you see a flattening of the effect. And I'd like to say that all the observational studies and trials that have come since then are in agreement with this, but they're not. So it's not a 
perfectly pretty story. Um, and part of it is because they, it's, it's getting to be messy out there. The drugs are getting better for treating uh, arrhythmias and for treating clotting disorders and for treating hypertension. And also, if you look, if you're at a population level where people are already eating a fair bit of fish, and you give them huge supplements with omega-3, it's probably not going to do much good. You can see it's a completely flat line after you get uh, above 250 milligrams per day. That doesn't explain all the differences. There are still some uncomfortablenesses out there about, well, is fish truly uh, beneficial? And some of it is because there are lots of trials that have been done where they give high-dose omega-3 fatty acids in a supplement, not as a protein package, but in a supplement. So I really would like to talk more about fish than sort of packaging all, all our micro and macronutrients in a pill. So um, part of the complicated aspects of this is that you don't need uh, EPA and DHA from fish sources. If you look at the top, you can get it from vegetable sources. You can, make, you can, you can consume alpha-linolenic acid, which is a fatty acid that's in soybean oil and a few other oils and, and plant foods. And actually, in the absence of seafood over a long time, your body actually gets a little bit better at converting the ALA to EPA and DHA. Um, so the conversion rates are pretty bad altogether. Um, as it is, we already have 10 times as much ALA in our diets as we do EPA and DHA on average. But most of us who have fish occasionally only convert about 2 or 3% of that ALA to EPA and DHA because we don't need it. It's an essential fatty acid. We're getting it from fish. We actually don't need to convert it. But people in, in, in Neil's studies, and I'm sure in Dean's studies, uh, are probably doing a little bit better job of converting it. And evidence would just suggest somewhere between 5 and 15% may get converted if you're completely devoid of seafood so long, over a long period of time. So that's, um, that's a great story. So it actually, we do have some common ground. You can eat fish or not eat fish. You're, it's not like we have vegetarians dying all over the place of sudden cardiac death because they're not getting EPA and DHA. So um, it was nice, actually. Walt had a student, uh, Walt and Alberto Escario had a student in our department who did a case control study in India where what happens if you have a population in the almost absence of fish and they have a fair bit of mustard oil in their diet, and you can see mustard oil is a good source of linolenic acid, and those that had a more mustard oil in their diet had a substantially lower risk of, of coronary heart disease. So that's nice. Those pieces actually fit together, common ground. You can come at it from either side. Either you eat a, a fair bit of vegetables off of linolenic acid or you eat fish. Um, the issue then comes up with contaminants in fish, and this is where kind of everybody in the media then turns right down, okay, I knew there was some reason there was something wrong with them. Um, so, you know, the problem is that we put out FDA advisories, there are EPA advisories, there's uh, every, every time you see a guideline for fish, there's always something saying, wait a minute, there's contaminants in fish. And it is true, we have incredible technology, we can measure things in parts per trillion in fish and tell you there are contaminants in fish, wild, farmed, I don't care if it's in your fish tank at home, there are contaminants in fish. So the, the issue is vulnerable populations. And that is for poor fetal de development. How far does that arrow on the right push up such that we should be telling women who are pregnant not to eat fish, potentially? Um, so the issue is, if you ask me where all the problems, um, is that some contaminants bioaccumulate. Big fish, fish eat smaller fish, and really big fish eat medium-sized fish, and that, that for um, swordfish and tilefish and shark have a fair bit of mercury in them because they've been eating smaller fish that have bioaccumulated the mercury over time. So um, Emily Oaken, who's a, a colleague at the Harvard Medical School, is probably one of the world's experts in this area, has studied the impact of fetal development among mothers that had different amounts of fish in their diets to look at mercury and omega-3s. And really what, in, in her conclusions, and she's pointed out that now there's actually 21 not-for-profit and other non-government agencies that have fish guidelines. So just to follow fish guidelines, you have to do a meta-analysis to see what the guidelines say. But in fact, what she has found is omega-3s are very important for fetal development and looking at um, ability for, for kids uh, when they're two years old to respond to cues or IQ even testing at, at age seven. And what she found is omega-3 is important to be there, but mercury is not a good, it, it, mercury should not be there. So we have to find the fish that don't have mercury, and there's lots of help with that. The EPA has put out fish guidance. It's actually in the last dietary guidelines. Um, the first time they put out the EPA advisory, they actually put it at the title as advisory, and that scared all women away from fish. So that had unintended consequences. So the next time they put it out as sort of what you need to know about mercury and fish and sell fish, it wasn't an advisory. It was really sort of eat fish, but stay away from those that are tilefish, swordfish, king mackerel, and shark. You can have some of these once in a while, but you should really stick to those at the bottom, like salmon, shrimp, and catfish, which maybe have a bit more, especially um, salmon, have more omega-3 fatty acids and almost no mercury. 
So clearly fetal development, um, it's important for the, uh, uh, the fetal development to have omega-3 fatty acids, and yet there are populations where they have very high exposures of mercury where you see de do see detrimental effects. And uh, we and others have sort of looked at harmful levels of mercury that are typically consumed in this country, and once you're an adult, they don't seem to impact risk of chronic disease unless you really eat um, tuna sushi twice a day. People start to have some neurologic symptoms because the, the, the mercury does build up, which is where the term Mad Hatter came from, because the Mad Hatter was getting a fair bit of mercury while making the hats. Um, so in the end, I think it is all about substitution and thinking about food as a something on the plate as opposed to omega-3 fatty acids. And this is something that Walt came up with that sort of summarizes what a lot of other people have said, that trans fat's worse than saturated fat, and refined sugar is probably worse than saturated fat. And as you work your way down to the bottom, polyunsaturated fats are you know, much better for you than saturated fat. I've had kind, of, kind of stolen this, snow without permission from Walt, um, just to bring in Frank Hu's comments. You know, fat is not food. Butter is not food. When you eat it by itself, really, you have to eat food. And so I've taken this and kind of said, OK, where does fish fit in this? Well, fish is a lot better for you than processed meat. It's probably better for you than all red meat. It's probably a little better for you than chicken or fried fish. And for Neil and Dean, you know, I don't know where it is, but I think we can come to common ground that vegetable protein is probably a good place to get some of these proteins. You don't necessarily need fish. But um, I think in the, uh, in the absence of being a vegan, I think fish can be a healthy replacement. And I'll leave you with Molly Katzen's uh, look at how to eat uh, seared tuna. You'll see the plate is full of, of mostly vegetables and has a small piece of, of, of seared tuna on the side. And so you can get your omega-3s and eat them too. Thank you very much.